This is a problem that um, has a lot of social and economic implications around the world. If humanoid bots take over the workplace and replace human labor, then you have a situation where you don't know what humans would do. And that's a risk for social fabric. That's a risk for um, the economic growth. That's a security risk. And um, this is, I feel, a perfect um, segue into a cause that you're very passionate about, CERN. Um, this is Amplify. I think um, if you could begin by just telling us a bit about the idea that you have in mind um, that you call Amplify. What is it about? Uh, and why is it that we need to start talking about such ideas? Yeah. Let me just preface this discussion with, with this, is that throughout human history, as new technologies have come along, we have always, every single time, created more new higher paying jobs than we did before. Now, there's something that feels different about this. We can see that these bots potentially get so good that they have the potential to replace all of human labor. So that's kind of what we're thinking about. In the short term, there's going to be all kinds of new jobs created to make humanoid bots, to train them, to maintain them, design workspaces for them, all, all kinds of things that we can't even imagine. Clothing, potentially, the whole industry to design clothing for bots, et cetera. But we're thinking, we're thinking ahead to a time when humanoid bots do start to displace workers. Now, on this, this chart, you know, we do have a global labor shortage problem. So that the, the time, the, the, the date when bots start replacing workers may still be quite a ways away. There's a lot of demand for labor right now that's unmet. Right. Companies are finding it difficult to find the talent that they need. The, the you know, the talent shortage is, is reaching, it's reached a 17 year high, according to some data. Um, by 2030, there's a report by Corn Ferry. They estimate that there'll be 85 million jobs that could go unfilled because there just aren't enough skilled people to take those jobs. Right. So it's, a, it's, it's the demographic challenges that we're talking about in terms of in all these countries, an older, very skilled workforce it's leaving the workforce and it's not being filled with younger skilled workers and it's leaving a void. And so humanoid bots could potentially help with this issue. They may not take those skilled jobs, but they may fill other roles that allow workers to, to retrain and take those, those jobs. So there's, you know, there's a shift that could happen there. The other part of this is, frankly, there are a number of jobs in the world that are deadly or dangerous that we really should work very hard to get rid of. So in the United States alone, uh, in 2022, five and a half thousand people died from work related injuries um, 2.8 million people had non-fatal injuries and illnesses from, from work. Globally, it's, it's, the numbers are staggering. About 300, almost 400 million workers sustained non-fatal work injury and about 2.6 million deaths from work-related diseases and accidents. Um, accidents accounted for about 330,000 deaths. So work can be dangerous for people. And it's not, it's not just deadly on the surface of, you know, you have an accident and you die. It's, it's over, over time. It's exposure to certain things, chemicals and things like that. So there's a lot of jobs that humans do that we really shouldn't do. If we had an alternative, you probably wouldn't pick a human to go into a coal mine and risk their life, risk their, you know, doing that work. And there's a number of other industries as well, chemical industries and so on. Just not, just not safe for people. But also, son, in a lot of countries, in a lot of parts of the world, people do those dangerous jobs because they have no other economic alternative, right? The yes. economy is not advanced. The society is not advanced enough to offer them the uh, the options. And if you look at the global south, um, and in 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 South Asia, you have, you still have human uh, human human workers who go into the sewers underground and physically clean sewers. Now, these are problems that are not only societal, but they're also economic and that these are people who can't find any alternative job. 
So I think you also have to consider the implications of what happens when robots start doing the jobs that even these people do at the absolute lowest rung um, of the economic strata. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the the ultimate goal would be to find ways to sort of train up those folks so that they can so that they can do other work that doesn't put them at risk. Um, you know, for example, if there is a bot industry in Indonesia and other countries like that that could allow people to to be trained to you know to manufacture bots, to train bots, to maintain bots. The whole supply chain behind the bot industry would be would be massive as well, and so it's creating an economic opportunity so that countries can sort of move up the economic food chain, so to speak, so that you don't need to use humans for some of the tasks that really they shouldn't be doing. So, just moving on to the next the next slide, I just want to give folks some background in terms of the economics of a humanoid bot versus human labor. Now, there's a lot that goes into this chart, but the numbers on the bottom, think of that as a proxy for the type of work that a humanoid bot can do. So if you pay somebody $5 an hour, that's the type of work that the humanoid bot can do at that level, right? Fairly simple task. To pay a human worker, it might cost you more like seven thirty, dollars depending on where you are in the world, because of benefits and taxes and other things, insurance and all kinds of things like that. The $5 an hour is more than that to the employer. But if you can deploy a humanoid bot, it might cost you only $3.80 an hour for the same work. Now, as the bot becomes more capable and, and moves up the spectrum and starts to do $10 and $15 an hour work, 20, 30, 40, the cost savings become larger and larger and larger versus humans. The principal reason behind this is that the humanoid bot can probably work 7,000 hours or more a year, and the human worker is maybe limited to a couple of thousand hours to three and a half to one ratio. Now that assumes that the bot works at the same pace as a human. So it's potentially the case that early on the bots will not be able to work at the same pace as a human worker, but it's also quite likely a few years from now that the bot actually is able to work faster than most human workers. So that three and a half to one ratio could go to five to six to seven over time. I learned from doing the analysis that I did is if you pay a human worker $15 an hour and it really costs you close to 22, that $15 an hour pay rate, that wage, is a pretty good proxy for the amount of money you'll save by deploying a bot. Now, again, I, I assumed all kinds of other expenses besides the, just the bot costs. There's actually some cost of hiring human workers to oversee the bots. That's all part of the, the numbers. But when you look at the lifetime savings of a bot, and let's just focus on the $15 an hour one, it's possible that the lifetime savings of a bot is around $615,000. And wow. if that's the case, you have created a massive economic incentive to everybody, every manufacturer, every country, anybody that pays for labor to deploy bots versus human labor, right? Yeah. And look at the savings at 20 and 30 and $40 an hour, you're up into the million. This, yeah creates an amazing incentive. But the downside of that is that potentially we're going to put a lot of people out of work right. at some point in the future. It might be yeah. 15, 20, 25 years from now. But yeah. if once the bots are capable of doing the work that humans are capable of doing at these wage rates, and I recognize that $15 an hour work is, is, is a wide range in the capability of that work, but just that is a, as a useful proxy, the savings are enormous. Now, yeah. Savings to the company is income to an employee. Hmm. So what are those people going to do? You've just put them out yeah. of work. Yes, you've saved $615,000, but that's income to somebody. Yeah. Right. Or, or several people. So can I, can I ask you a quick question? Are you, are you also taking into account jobs lost by generative AI or is it just embodied AI in robots? Just robots. Wow. So that's a very good point because AI in general will put a lot of workers out of work. And it won't just be the bots. It'll be AI that's not embodied in human form as well. Yeah. And we've already seen that in many industries. Yeah. That's already happening. 
so with this chart, I just wanted to show the potential profitability of deploying humanoid bots for the bot makers, right? And we're looking at profit margins that range from 60 to low 70%. Some people have numbers even higher than this. I, I've actually bur burdened my model with a number of expenses to keep these profit margins down, that these are enormous profit margins. So you're being conservative. I, I think I am. I'm trying to be and relative to other people that have put bot models out there my numbers i think are pretty conservative but at 15 dollars an hour if the bot's doing that work a company that's that's making the bot and providing the robot as a service they could be making about twenty-one thousand dollars a year at, at that level and you can see if the bot becomes more capable and does work that's at higher wage rates the bot can make 30 45 to 60 thousand dollars a year and even down at the five dollar an hour wage rate if it's only doing that kind of work the bot could still make about six thousand dollars a year and so a car company would be very happy to make six thousand dollars on a car it sells one time and hope you come back some years later and buy another car and then make another six thousand this is six thousand dollars a year in profit year after year after year for the life of the bot per bot. So start applying some numbers of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions to this, and you get some massive numbers very quickly. Back to the challenge of what are these people going to do that eventually start to lose their jobs? Now, some people say, well, that's that's not the bot maker's problem. Some people say it's not even the problem of the company that laid them off, right? But a company, yes. a CEO that can lay off a human will. Let's yes. just assume that as as the baseline. Right. And so if this is going to happen and we can see the economic incentive for it to happen, then you're going to have a, potentially a lot of people that are out of work, either for a period of time until they can get retrained or for a long period of time because they just there's just no work for them to do anymore because the bots are doing the work. So this is where the idea of Amplify came in because... If you just leave it in the hands of government, you run the risk that this industry gets throttled back in some way. Okay. Or that the government applies some crazy tax that just yes. makes this so much less attractive. Now, okay. there hold, are some hold, checks and balance. Hold, hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Yep. And I want to get back to it. But I, I, I want to bring in Dr. Walter here because it's important to put this, put the, the numbers in perspective with the technology. And Dr. Walter, we've, we've, talked about the evolution of the technology of the hardware and of scaling up. These are scary numbers. If looking at the current um, cadence of evolution of the bots and the versions that we see, and let's just assume that the most advanced bot is clearly the Tesla bot, which is Optimus. To get to a point that Sun has just shown us with those numbers, how far away is it? How far over the horizon are we talking about? Are this Is this scenario becoming a reality? Let's say I've become more sanguine based on some of the, the models that CERN has been putting together. So initially I thought there's probably going to be this like almost overnight ramp up that is going to come in there and suddenly everyone's going to be unemployed. But when you start to really drill down and look at that, especially when you look at the labor shortage there already is. So there's millions of jobs that we have to be able to plug already. Um, in some ways, I almost feel like the robots aren't going to get here soon enough to fill some of those demographic plugs. And it's it's a little bit longer before we, we get in there. So it seems that initially, as these are going up there, it's not going to be disruptive society. It's going to be very, very beneficial. It's much longer term than that. So as we get deep into the 2030s, that, that's when it seems like it's going to be happening more likely around there. And at that time, There'll be so many other transitions going on. It may be that it, we're able to kind of smooth it out. But what it means is we've got enough time to start talking about it, which is you know why we're here sort of brainstorming on what it's going to look like to get an idea. So you start to mold these, these policies sooner rather than later. Because if a policy yeah. is reactionary, then usually it's the worst policy possible. So everyone has to start thinking about it. And... Yeah. There has is, is been, this, let's say, precedence with CEOs of companies, let's say, looking out for the best interests of their company, of their employees, because it was also in their best interests. Henry Ford was a shareholders. He came up with a minimum wage and paid his workers something 
or a decent wage because he saw his workers as potential customers. There's only so many people he could sell that car to. Yeah. And he needed to come up with it. He needed to create a middle class to be able to afford the car. So he did that. He created the weekend because, you know, the whole idea is that people want to get in the car and drive out. So, you know, if you're going to have this free leisure time. So, you know, there, there are incentives in many ways. And I think you're going to see the same thing that everyone's going to realize collectively that you need to do it. And if you look at, Every single major corporation, they do a lot of philanthropy. You know, maybe donating to the local symphony or or something like that. But you know, they like to be seen doing things like that that are yeah. good for the community, See good yourself, for society. Yeah. And when they begin to realize this as a collective, they could act. I'm not saying they will act, but they could act. And part of it is they will act if there's a good model out there that starts to make sense. And especially if the alternative might be you know, something being heavily taxed and everything else. So that's why we're having these discussions right now. And okay. that there, you know, UBI has been put on the table by many, many people. And you yeah. get very, you, it elicits very strong emotional reactions from a lot of people when you talk about that. And so what CERN is doing is he's presenting a model, which is not UBI based at all. It's more or less like looking, how, how could you potentially do that without having to have that as a way of, of doing the transition. And part of it is just coming up with a new skill set. And I think that makes sense. Um, and I'll let CERN continue because it's his model. And, Absolutely. And before, before I, do, I just, I just want to push you a bit further, mm -hmm. just for a moment, uh, on the timeline. So you just, just so that we're clear, and everybody who's, who's watching and listening mm -hmm. is clear, you're saying this is a scenario we're going to see in the mid-2030s. Am I? Did I get you right? That, that's when you could start to see the displacement. But again, we don't know what yeah. the demographic trends are really going to be like. We don't know how the yeah. economy is going to restructure. We don't know how AI, because it could be that the labor shortage is, you know, the shortage of labor we have right now is replaced with attorneys <laughs> because AI is putting all the attorneys and they need to make a living. And suddenly now they're going to have to actually do something which is very different. So that could be yeah, one. Because to me, the, 20, yeah. the mid 2030s is, is, very conservative. Um, and I'm afraid that, look, when we started talking about AGI, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the start of the discussion was, oh, it's in the 2060s, and then it became the 2040s, and then the, 20, uh, the 2030s. And now th there seems to a common, be a common consensus that you will probably have AGI this yeah, decade. Yeah. But but the so question is, AGI, like, how, how, much, how, dis how much it starts to display some of these things? So just looking at purely at the human bot level, and of course, it could just accelerate super, super fast. But yeah. looking at the way it's going in there, it seems like it's more or less like plugging a gap as opposed to creating one. And mm -hmm. it will also help in other ways because a lot of the, the labor market is that you have um, a lot of competition for, for all these different areas where people need workers and they can't get it. And there's still a shortage. It doesn't matter how much you pay, there's still a shortage. But if you're able to solve the problem here, You've effectively solved it over there because then those yeah. those human workers that are able to do both jobs will now move over to there, even if the bot can only do one. So there's going to be a reallocation of resources that way that will kind of help out. I'm like saying it's the initial ride will not be that bumpy. It'll be kind of smooth. And then at some point you might start to get a sense Once that, okay, that the bots are yeah. really starting to put people out of work. But it may be yeah. at that point our educational systems and everything else are sort of seen that and they know it's like, well, wait a minute. We start training people for what is really the bot economy. Who knows? There may be some sort of regulations and taxes that put a little bit of a break on everything that's going on there. And, yeah. um, you know, the, the bots, it, it's going to be interesting is that as their skill set goes up, yeah, they're not as attractive in doing the lower wage jobs anymore, right? Because there's more yeah. profit over here than it is there. And they're going to move over there. And ironically, it's going to be the lower paid jobs will probably be the ones that are the last to be you know, to go out of existence because they will always kind of be there yeah. because you'll be competitive with the bots. Yeah. Also, because um, these numbers that Sun's showing us are simply scary mm -hmm. and crazy. And I can't help but um, look at the entire, the, the total job market and see it, uh, the attack on it from both fronts. You have knowledge AGI at the top, which already has begun to replace um, human jobs in the creative fields. And then you have bots at the bottom end of the labor market that's going to replace it. So my fear, my personal, my personal fear is, and this is why I'm spending a lot of time on this, is because I want my 
my viewers to understand the implications and the severity of the situation that we seem to be hurtling towards. And these numbers put that um, that that picture in, in sharp and very brutal uh, context. And it's I think we we it's not only important to talk about this right now, but given the cadence of development, it we need to get on to policy formulation and we need to get on to the solutions. And so let's talk about the solutions that Amplify has to offer. Right. So, so this chart again was the industry without Amplify. And if you go to the next chart, this shows the profit of the bot maker versus the taxes that they might pay. And I used a 25% tax rate in some countries, it's going to be more or less. But you can see that the profit is pretty high relative to the taxes, right? And a lot of people are happy with this. A lot of people are not happy with this, depending on how you view taxes and, and so on. It is just what it is. Now, if we go to the next chart, this is where I'm introducing the concept of, of Amplify. What is Amplify? Amplify is a voluntary nonprofit program that could be set up by a bot maker. It could be set up by the bot industry. It could be set up by the bot maker and its customers. Or all of those parties could do their own version of Amplify. So Amplify is more of a, an idea than it is a single organization. Amplify could be different in different markets, different countries, different regions, depending on what the needs are. So for example, let's say we discover that bots are beginning to take jobs in a certain area. And there's, let's say, one, let's say it's auto manufacturers are deploying bots and laying off auto workers left and right. Those workers quite likely could be retrained to do other jobs. Amplify is there to provide funds to help those people retrain them. And my thinking is that that retraining is probably better done by industry and companies than just by the government. And the government is very effective at doing lots of things and terrible at doing other things. So the idea is that the industry puts some of the cost savings that they get from using humanoid bots, the bot makers take some of their profits and put it into Amplify. And again, there could be hundreds, if not thousands of different Amplifies focused on helping people retrain from being an automaker to being something else or, you know, whatever job is being displaced into some other area. So Amplify could be very targeted in terms of its objectives. This is a way for companies to also ensure that they get the labor force that they want and need in the future, right? So let's say you are, again, an automaker and you've laid off a bunch of your auto workers. Maybe you still need those workers to do different types of jobs, right? And so why not then, you know, help them retrain to effectively work in those different areas. It's very difficult to sit here today and look into the future and say, okay, these are the jobs that are going to be created and here's what we need. That's very difficult. It's much easier to look at the jobs that are going to be displaced, hmm. but we, we can look sit here today and look into the future and say, well, we think there's going to be a massive need for job retraining on a scale that we've never seen before. We, we see the potential for that. So this model is showing what happens if the bot maker takes one third of their pre-tax profit and puts it into an organization I'm calling Amplify. But what I wanted to show here is that the economics for the bot maker are still pretty attractive under this model. Right. And this assumes they're still paying corporate income taxes. And this is a profit margin of you know high 30s to almost 50%. That's a pretty profitable business to have a net margin in that range. Yeah. And they're still making, you know, depending on where the, where the bots are being deployed and how capable they are, yeah. you know, $4,000 per bot up to $40,000 per bot. And again, you're being conservative with your numbers. I, I believe so. And if you look at the next chart, I contrast these profits with the taxes and with the Amplify receipts in the middle and green. 
And so Amplify, you know, if it's done to this degree, which is a third of pre-tax profit, maybe that's higher than it needs to be. And, and this is just from the bot maker's perspective. The bot customer also has significant savings and it could be further amplified by taking some of those savings and putting it into a program like this. Now, these companies could set this up and they could disband it if the need is not there. I mean, it just, nothing, nothing needs to be created here and we don't need to create this behemoth that lasts forever. It's just the idea is that industry can work together to help people and also meet the needs of their future workforce, whatever that may look like. Because if we don't do this, I worry that the yellow part of this chart becomes massive. And then you've got a program, a tax base that's that's cast in stone and is very difficult to change at some point. We we all know that often when taxes get put into place, they tend to stay there for a long time. It may not be as adaptable as what we need in a society where humanoid bots are taking a whole set of jobs in one area, one one year, and then the next year, maybe it's a whole other area. So the idea behind this is to have industry sort of work together to figure this out and help help everybody. This table is really nothing to do with Amplify other than to show that there are so many advantages of humanoid robots. It's not just about saving money. There are so many other benefits. And even if a company does not save any money by using a humanoid, the benefits could still outweigh the costs of you know deploying the bots. A workforce that doesn't get sick, that's never late, that never gets tired, doesn't need retirement or healthcare benefits and so on. There's just so many, so many benefits potentially for humanoid robots that it's very clear to us that, that they will be deployed as soon as they possibly can be once they become capable and once the industry is able to manufacture enough of them. Yeah. The manufacturing part is is a solvable problem. We, we've seen industry scale up rapidly before. The smartphone industry scaled up from nothing, essentially in 2007 when Apple rolled out the iPhone. By 2015, Apple was making two, over 200 million iPhones. That's just one company, that's not the industry. So the same yeah. will happen here too. Once, once these bots become capable of enough, they will be made in the millions. Let's scale. And it's a lot yeah. simpler to make a bot than it is to make a car, isn't it, Dr. Walter? Uh, yes, it, it's much easier, no, no doubt about it. It's a bit more complex than a cell phone, but definitely easier than a car. So it should cost less, plus the the plant you need to set up is going to be a lot smaller as well. Uh, you do not need to go through something like building up uh, you know, Giga Texas or Giga Berlin and all that that entails. It's much easier. No Giga presses are needed to be able to make the parts for the bot. It's it's all very simple. You could just go into any area that is light industrial right now and just find some vacant building and take it over and probably set everything up. And most of the equipment you need in there, you could probably buy it and have it within there within a, a month or two. Some of it could just be used equipment or new equipment that's out there, but nothing that's like of the scale, like I say, like a, a Giga Press, which uh, usually the back order is like, I think a couple of years at this point right now. Let's talk about the realities of politics and our, and us and the societies we live in. <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Even sure you want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, we talk about these grand ideas and we talk about them from a very hopeful, positive, very utopian perspective. And we, People like us are often accused of seeing the world through, looking at the world through rose tinted glasses and believing that everything is good and bright and positive and everybody will do their bit for the benefit of humanity. But the reality is just the opposite. And that every entity, be it a, an individual or a company or a government or a section of society will do whatever is within the realm of possibility to take advantage of the other. So, how do we get governments and corporates to start thinking along the lines of Amplify? Not only to start conversations, but also thinking of um, developing programs that will meet the objectives that Amplify as an idea is trying to, to meet. My, my first thing is, is there's a carrot and stick approach. Yeah, the stick is very clear. The governments are gonna come in here heavy handed with either regulations or taxes. Um, so that's, that's kind of an incentive right there. And then, you know, the carrot in many ways is to realize how advantageous it is. Again, you know, Henry Ford realized 
hey, if, if my workers are being paid a decent wage, they'll be able to buy my product, they'll become customers. So um, anyone who's running a, a small business, they understand economics, they, they know how the dollar circulates through the economy, you know, the, the velocity of, of, of money and everything else. And one of the things that I think Amplify does is it, it's focusing more on the specific community that might be affected because that's where you really have to make the decisions of like, what kind of impact are we having here? What do we have to do to turn it around? What are the jobs that we train for? So we're not training them for jobs that they're not going to find locally. We're going to have an idea what's going on there. So that's why it's very important to make sure it's a, a collaboration between all the stakeholders that are around there. So it's in everyone's interest. No, no one wants to have social upheaval. You know, there's no profit in that. Absolutely not. So um, in the, in the end, there's that's kind of the carrot part of it is to make sure that you have the social cohesion because otherwise there aren't going to be any people to buy the bots that you're supposed to be making all this profit over. Um, yeah. And at the same time, there is the concern that if you do not do something, someone else will, and the way they do it may not be the way that you'd want it to be. So. And then I think the other thing as far as usually people are taken advantage of because they're not aware of something, you know, they, they, they haven't been informed. There's been lack of information. And part of what we're doing here is making sure people are informed of what's coming. So they are able to make those decisions. So they're able to bring us up with their policymakers when, when they're having discussions and, and ask them, do you realize what's going on? And, you know, everyone's going to have to judge is like, okay, is this just, you know, something that we're, we're making up that the bots are coming and it's never really going to happen. You have to judge for yourself. I've looked at it and realized it's no longer science fiction. It is really going to happen. Oh, I can't yeah. pin a date on it. I just know it's going to be in my lifetime. And I'm sure in the lifetimes of everyone else that's, that's watching. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you look at um, geopolitics um, and when financial matters come into the scope of geopolitics, any country that can will uh, not only take advantage, but also protect its interests by trying to corner the largest piece of the pie and trying to restrict other country, countries from not only developing, but also gaining access to this to the, such technology. And how do you account for that? Yeah, I mean, those are difficult questions to answer. You know, if you think about it, you know, in terms of a game of chess, you've got chess being played at the societal level in terms of people trying to find jobs. You've got chess being played at company level, competition with each other. You've got chess being played at the nation state level, right? And the intersection of all those things kind of creates a 3D chess board of sorts. Um, maybe not the best analogy, but it gets the point across that this is a complicated thing that nobody can really control this you know if if a nation gets concerned about how this is developing in their country and decides to regulate it or tax it or slow it down in some way because of concerns about how people are dealing with it they may find themselves at a competitive disadvantage very quickly versus other nations that don't do that so you need a lot of input from a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives to make sure that whatever decisions are being made around this, consider all of those viewpoints. Yeah, that's, that's the key. As far as Amplify, to Scott's point, Amplify is there to help in very specific situations. The, you know, if industry sets aside money, then you can help those workers go from job A to job B and you can train them. And now you're meeting a very localized need. That to me makes a lot of sense. You don't need a lot of input in that, in that case from governments and society in general. You're, just, you're helping a very specific subset of people. Those people that lost their job from company XYZ now can be employed in company ABC thanks to this training program. So you're presuming that there will be enough of job B to replace job A? Well, initially, yes. But long term, I, I do see the possibility, ignoring all of human history and technology advancement, where we've always had more higher paying jobs. I think that will continue for a while. But I do foresee the potential if AI becomes powerful enough, either not embodied or embodied, that all of human jobs 
could be potentially eliminated or the vast majority could be eliminated yeah. by AI systems, yeah. bots or not. So, yeah. so in, in that case, we're even talking about something that, that Amplify can't solve. We're talking about how do we restructure the entire economic system? Hmm. Because in that case, if no one has income from work, then how do they afford the products and services that they want? Well, all those products and services can be can be created without problem. In fact, we, we would have an abundance of goods and services. The yeah, question I mean, is it, how, how you deliver that to, to, to people. Yeah. And how do you deliver that to people in an equitable manner? Yeah. Um, and then again, you have nation states vying for supremacy um, because Dr. Walter, if you look back at top of mind, the the comparison I would draw would be with the, the space industry and the global space race. We started off with the Apollo program, which uh, saw wonderful cooperation, dis, uh, you know, even uh, between the United States and Russia and other countries, even at the peak of the Cold War. And today we have moved to an, a, a global space race where China is being pitted against America. We're seeing something similar with AI in as far as back as 2018. I remember when I was studying a bit of uh, where investments were flowing into AI, almost 75 to 80% of invest, global investments in AI were headed to China because you could do a lot more in China because uh, you could get away with a lot more in China than you could uh, in America or in Europe. You have Elon Musk talk about a future of plenty. Um, ARK Invest, Kathy Woods talk about deflationary uh, impact that AI, uh, knowledge AI and embodied AI and robotics would have. But I just, the skeptic in me just finds it very difficult to, um, to have faith in governments and societies, judging from what history has taught us. Yeah, and again, that, that's why we need to sort of ponder these things before we have that issue that uh, things come to a head and that rather than seeing that there's a way of negotiating your way through it, they just decide that, oh, societal upheaval um, is the answer. We, we don't want that. We, we clearly want to find a way to make the transition for what's going to be an age of abundance a less bumpy road. Uh, we have seen it happen before where there was major displacements and for the people who went through it, it wasn't so great. But when you got to the other side, it was all right. So the starting out of the industrial revolution, of course, we know about the looms, all the, the workers that were sort of put out of, of work because of that, and they weren't going to have jobs anymore. But eventually we found jobs for them. Um, but again, these are the analogies that we're not sure if they apply today because, you know, it, we could be seeing something very different. But Again, we have been there before. I remember, uh, well, I wasn't this old, but let's say I remember the tale <laughs> that, that when uh, photography was invented in the, um, the early 19th century, you know, the fear was what this is going to do is going to put artists out of business. Out of the whole it, idea yeah. of the artist was to make the portraits. So basically, they were the people that were recording what was going on. And they were, you know, they tried to be as faithful as possible to um, what the subject was. So they were documentarians and that was it. And then, you know, the photography comes out and suddenly you don't need a portrait artist anymore and all that. So what do they do? They come up with French impressionism and modernism and cubism and stuff like that. So we became very creative and it's, and, and, and you can thank the, the camera and the invention of that for a lot of the great art we had after that, because that was the reaction to that. And now of course, People who use the cameras aren't just recording it. I mean, they are also themselves artists. They figured out how to take this as a new medium and do something else. And so um, I, I guess I, I, I'm a bit more sanguine of, about the future just because I really think we will figure something out. And it's going to come down to um, labor will be a choice. It, it won't be something that you have to do. And that a lot of people do get their fulfillment from doing certain labor around the house. And, you know, I could see situations where, where, you know, you have a family meal or something like that. And, you know, the bot can go and clean up the dishes. I go, no, I get this. It's just something You're I like. a lot and, of faith in human nature. Well, a lot of times, if you ever think about it, when you have Thanksgiving dinner or something like that, people come together, 
a lot of times people just bond over the fact that they're they're cleaning the dishes together. You know, someone's drying something like that. That's where the conversation strikes up. And and everyone kind of likes the fact that they're doing some kind of manual task or something like that because it gives you a sense that you, you're doing something, you're helping out. I don't think we're going to abandon those qualities. So the robot will be there to do the things that maybe we don't want to do or we will do it together. You know, people think the bot's going to fold laundry. You know what? I have a feeling the bot's going to fold laundry with you. I mean, it's going to be this companion. Oh, let's go over and let's 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 start folding the t-shirts together. And you go over and you have a conversation with 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 your bot while you're doing that or something else. Yeah. So there's a good chance that it's not going to be that we just make the bot go and do everything for us and we sit around and we're we're lazy on the couch. Yeah. It's going to be up for all of us to get a certain amount of initiative, but eventually we'll begin to realize that um, it will be more of a companion, a labor saving device. But in the end, labor will be a choice and we will enjoy it. And there are people who love cutting the lawn, you know, and, and they will still do it. And now they may like having ops because like every now and then it's like it becomes a chore. Oh, today, I haven't, you know, I just don't have time for it. I just wish someone else would do it. And there are other days like, ah, I just want to go out there. I want to do the gardening. I want to put my hands in the soil. Yeah. You don't have to do that. Why do people have these strange hobbies that are like, you're doing farming. I thought we got rid of farming years ago. You can just go down to the store and buy the, all the tomatoes and everything that you want. It's like, no, I want to grow my own tomatoes. I want to go through. Yeah. That. Homesteading is what it's is, like to is, till is the earth and all that. Though. So yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it, it will be a choice and that we'll be able to find a balance. And at some point, you know, some of those crazy profits you see in there, you can't, those profits are not sustainable because yeah. there's competition. Okay. You know, and and whenever you have something that's outside like that, everyone else starts to come in and they start eating away at that till the profits get down to something more reasonable, which might be like the 25, 30 percent level. But I don't think that you can see like 90 percent profit ad finitum um, yeah. because that's the whole nature of markets and competition. I could be completely wrong because. <laughs> The market might be changing completely, but based on you know my understanding of economic theory, competition always comes in to make sure the, the playing field gets a bit leveled. Sure. All right. So, so next steps. How have you thought about what uh, your next steps for for this idea of Amplify would look like? What would what would it look like um, as far as corporates are concerned? As far as governments are concerned? Take us through your thoughts. Yeah, just before I answer that question, I just want to tag on to what Scott just said. When I run my models longer term, mm -hmm. I assume that the cost to run a bot is about $3 an hour. Um, and at that level, uh, you can you can still get about 50% profit margins. Um, that's without using Amplify. This with Amplify, you're at 50% margins after Amplify. So. I'm assuming that the profitability does diminish over time as you've you've got you know one and a half billion bots in the world. At that point, it becomes a pretty competitive marketplace. Um, but to answer your question, you know, the Amplify idea right now is just an idea. We're we're talking about it. We we want to get folks input. It'll be interesting to see as this industry develops and as bots are deployed what companies choose to do to the extent that they're displacing labor. Again, I think it'll be a while before that happens because there's plenty of jobs that go unfilled. That's where the bots can be slotted into very quickly. But over time, we will see how companies make this individual collective decision about how they're going to handle the workers that they displace. And I think at that time is when Amplify, you know, the conversations really need to be had with every single one of those companies. The idea now is just to put put it out there, get feedback, yeah. refine it, hone it, discuss it, um, and just think about it. Um, and, and how do how do folks reach out to you? How if yeah. if any of my viewers want to get involved, how do they reach out to you? Yeah, the best place is to reach out to Scott and I on X, uh, formerly Twitter, and our X handles are on the screen. Yep. And that is uh, Dr. Scott Walter is at Going Ballistic 5. And of course, CERN is at CERN Basher, as you said.
All right. Well, exciting times, exciting ideas. And um, the future does look very, very abundant and bright, but not without caveats, <laughs> unfortunately. As always, this is the real world that we live in. <laughs> having said that, it's been brilliant having you back on uh, again. And I look forward to many more conversations about these uh, fascinating aspects of this world that we look forward to living in and uh, having the future generations uh, grow up in. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Dr. Scott Walter, as well as Sung. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Raiden. Thank you, Raiden. It's been great.